For the past 25 years, Chris Bird has been the director of the Alachua County Environmental Protection Department, or EPD. On a countywide basis, including municipalities, County EPD provides services in water resources management, natural resources protection, pollution prevention, hazardous waste management, and petroleum cleanup. Previously, Chris worked as an environmental engineer for the private sector and the United States Department of Energy. Chris is a past board of directors chair for the National Association of Local Government Environmental Professionals, a board member of the Florida Stormwater Association, and past president of the Florida Local Environmental Resources Agencies. Chris served on the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Local Government Advisory Committee. Chris is an advocate for climate change resiliency, green infrastructure, low impact development, and local initiatives to strengthen water and natural resources protection. Chris holds degrees in environmental engineering and chemistry. Welcome, Chris. Hey, welcome. So, you know, I've, I've heard that your retirement date has been set and that in March of 2020, you will uh, leave your long service at the county. And uh, it dawned on me today that you are the longest active serving department director in Alachua County. So, uh, so you're hanging it up, huh? Well, yeah, I am. And, um, you know, I've, I, it's been a great run, um, but I think it's, it's time for um, some new leadership. And, um, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I was thinking like how many county managers or how many commissions that I've served under and you know they've all brought something to the table that's made this community a better place. Right. Um, what is the total number of years? When did you start? I, um, 32, I'll be, it'll be 32 years I think when I retire. And so. 26 as the director? Yeah, yeah, about 26. Oh yeah, by then it will be. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, again, it's, um, I mean, I serve at the will of the county manager. That's the, that's the department directors. Um, that's the situation. And, you know, you, you have to learn sometimes how to navigate. But I think, um, you know, if, as long as you, you do a good job and you keep in mind what you're there for, you know, it all works out. I'm still here. <laughs> you, you made it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I want to I want to talk about you know really dissect what you do over at EPD and I know at the top of the list one of the th most important items is water resource management um, and that includes a number of things can you can you give us kind of an overview of what's involved in that we we do focus on water and I think even some of our programs like hazardous materials hazardous waste collection. Um, natural resources protection. It, this county, um, with with so many amazing water resources and, and a community that really values those, um, that's really helped to set the programming that we do. And the you know kind of when we show up every day, what we're really concentrating on. I know stormwater is an important part of water resource management, and the county actually made a decision to to approach the funding for stormwater in a new way. Tell us, tell us about that evolution. Well, <coughs> yeah, Mark, that's one of the newer programs. And what the county uh, three years ago adopted a stormwater utility. And basically, this is an assessment of property. It's not based on value. It's based on the amount of stormwater runoff. And we did that so that we would have a stable funding source for um, really dealing with what's becoming an emerging issue, um, stormwater. What, what we know is the, the climate is changing. And um, even though we have dry spells and we can actually have extended droughts where you know, there's water shortages, but we also know, and we've seen it the last few years, we can have extensive flooding, at least nuisance flooding. Fortunately, we have not experienced anything like they've had in some of the coastal communities, but we're still very vulnerable to, to flooding. And, um, I think if you look at it for a lot of the development in Alachua County, before the 1980s, there was really no requirements to manage stormwater. So if you developed a site and you created pavement and it ran off, it basically ran off onto your neighbor's property or downhill. Um, and we, we know that that's really expensive to deal with those type of situations. And we do have some neighborhoods in Alachua County that are suffering from chronic nuisance flooding. So 
the stormwater assessment really helps us deal with some of that, but it, if nothing else, it helps, um, for example, our public works crews, it, it allows them, the staffing, to just clean out the ditches and clean out the culverts and make sure they're not clogged up when we do get a big storm. And, and that's, that's an important part of the stormwater assessment. About half of it goes to those kinds of nuts and bolts, take mm -hmm. care of the infrastructure, and about half goes towards water quality. That's uh, true, and that's the board's policy, that right. they split the, the funding um, really 50-50 between those two programs. The water quality part of it really is trying to play catch up. We've got um, some degraded water bodies and in areas of the county that are, have been polluted from stormwater. And um, you know the biggest one is really Noonan's Lake. And so we've, we've been able to use the local money to leverage state money and water management district money. But the idea is that we do need to do some um, retrofitting of some of these existing watersheds to try to make them more resilient. And, and this was not an unusual kind of funding source that was implemented. I know the city of Gainesville has had a stormwater assessment for years, as have communities all around the state of Florida. So We, we were kind of late coming to it. It's, I, I'm not sure exactly why, but you know, we finally got there. But yeah, we, we, um, we, Gainesville's had one. And one thing that's unique about ours compared to Gainesville's is ours is based on the size of the house. So if you live in a smaller house, you pay less than if you live in a very large house with a big driveway and all. And I know some of them, they don't do that. You know, I know that water quality is, is essential, springs protection. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with you at the state level when it comes to uh, getting bodies like Post Springs on the outstanding Florida water mm -hmm. uh, list. Um, we have also, in recent months, uh, you know, it all ties together, and certainly landscape irrigation and fertilizer, uh, the new ordinances have, uh, have garnered a lot of attention, and uh, those have been very important initiatives brought by EPD to the board, and the board has uh, instituted some, some pretty strong uh, policies. Can you tell us, can you talk about irrigation and fertilizer and those yeah. new ordinances? Well, really, those are some areas, and we kind of bundle all that together in what we call resilient landscaping. I mean, that's what we're trying to become. Um, but there's a tremendous waste of water for just irrigating people's yards. Like 50% of a typical residential house, um, if they're irrigating, that's half of their water use is just to water the lawn. Um, we really are leading the state right now, not only on water conservation in terms of having a efficiency standards for irrigation systems, but also, like you mentioned, fertilizer. Um, we've established a new eight-month blackout period where eight months of the year um, we do not allow fertilizing. And we believe that that will work out. The, 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 the data shows that our, our landscaping should be resilient to that. But we have a lot of local governments, not only in Florida, but around the country that are really looking at what the county commission has adopted in the last couple of years in terms of water resiliency. I know you're trying to find the right balance between some people's desire to have the traditional beautiful lawn and the environmental impacts of those lawns. Um, as far as the irrigation, Chris, can you kind of give us just an idea of what the new regulation is? Um, well, what we're doing is we're following a program developed by the Water Management District called Florida Water Star. And it's really just an efficiency um, standard. But for outdoor irrigation, it really just has to do with making sure that the um, companies that are installing these systems are installing them efficiently. Um, you know, the, the, the homeowner is the one stuck with the, the monthly water bill. And unfortunately, we've had a lot of really shoddy construction on these irrigation systems that leak and they're not sized right. And the contractor gets paid and it's the homeowner that ends up with the big water bill. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're really not only trying to save water, but we're also trying to keep money in people's pockets. Right. Um, I know water quality monitoring is one of the duties that you have at EPD. Tell, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit mm -hmm. more about that. Well, we, that's a long-term program. In fact, we were lucky we've received state funding for that program through a contract for, I think, over 30 years. 
and it really allows us to monitor some of our major um, creeks and, and the Santa Fe River and also groundwater. Um, and we can establish trends. We can kind of get an idea, are we doing better, are we doing worse? Um, where are the hot spots? Where do we really need to focus, for example, those stormwater projects? Where should they go? So sort of that saying of what gets measured gets managed and the, the monitoring allows us to do that. I know you, you keep an eye on watershed in general and you have projects for restoration of the watershed. Can you, uh, can you cite one of those? The, the big one, and you know, we're really excited. It's, it, it took a long time to get in the shape it's in and it's not gonna get fixed overnight, but Noonan's Lake. And um, just real quick, there's been a lot of ditching and channelization of the drainage system in East Gainesville. And the biggest example is the Gainesville Airport. When they built the airport back when it was, I think, World War II, they really kind of drained some wetlands to create the, the airport. When they did it, they cut into this phosphate layer of clay. And that phosphate, um, laden soils have been leaching into Noonan's Lake probably since World War II. What we're building are some filters to, we call them bio weirs, but they're really, um, they will allow um, absorption of a lot of this phosphorus before it gets into Noonan's Lake. So it won't stop the, the, the part that's already gotten into the lake. That's another bigger issue, but it'll kind of stop the, the bleeding, so to speak, in terms of new input. So, um, we, we received state funding for that. I know you helped us with that. And, and the Water Management District has um, also put some money in the pot. And then we also have our stormwater assessment. So we see this as a long-term um, project, but it'll make a big difference um, if we're patient. Before we leave water resource, I, I had a conversation recently with somebody who was talking about how little the impact of our new irrigation ordinance would be, how much water was involved. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it dawned on me, it's so easy to just say, oh, don't do that one thing because that won't have enough impact or don't do that one thing. And yet, you know, it's going to be, it's not going to be one project that protects our water. It's gonna be a series of, of small impacts leading up to larger impacts. Yeah. And it just made me very proud of what, what we've done here. Yeah, and again, I think part of it has to do with uh, discretionary water use versus, for example, we need water to grow food. I mean, so there's a lot of it is really just kind of recognizing that. Um, let's talk about natural resources protection a little bit and land development and EPD's part mm -hmm. in that whole process. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, it goes back to the county's comprehensive land use plan in terms of protecting some of our um, significant wildlife habitats and such. And really part of that way back was protecting wetlands. Now what we've done with the wetland protection um, in I think it was last year, the county commission um, actually made, through the county charter, made those wetland protection um, countywide. So right. they apply within the cities now. And you know, we, what we found out over time, and we've been advised by climate change experts that the, probably the most important single thing Alachua County can do to prepare for climate change is protecting wetlands. Mm -hmm. And um, I could go into why, but you know, basically wetlands, um, they, they're like nature's kidneys. They filter dirty water, they hold water. When we have a drought, an extended drought, the last place there's still water kind of held up is in the wetlands. They really help us during floods. They can just soak up a lot of excess water. So, um, and they're low maintenance. I mean, they don't require pumps and pipes and energy and, and um, staffing. So, you know, it's really taking an advantage. And I think the whole natural resources program recognizes the services that natural systems can play and provide for us if we'll just let them do it, if we don't really tear them up. You know, I, I know we got some pushback from municipalities, yeah. um, and the county commission certainly has a great deal of respect for home rule and local governments making decisions. Mm -hmm. But uh, in this case, I know ultimately the deciding factor was that wetlands and water don't pay a lot of attention to lines on a map. 
That's correct. And if you look at the water goes downhill, basically. And, um, you know, I think what really helped us with that, we did get pushback, but we've also had some big storms in the last few years. And a lot of the places that we we're trying to protect, I think the, the community recognized that some of those places were underwater during those storms. So the idea of um, keeping buildings out of those areas and roads and such, it's just common sense. You know, one of my favorite places to visit among you know, within county government is the Household Hazardous Waste Center. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that hazardous, hazardous material management is a big part of your mission at EPD. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us a little bit more about that. And, and by the way, I, what I like about it is when I drive up there, they come out. Before I even get out of the car, they're mm -hmm. standing there. I open up my trunk. They help me take stuff out. I love the reuse area where I fe frequently put stuff back <laughs> into my trunk. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but t tell us about the setup out there. And, and well, what you we're do. <coughs> we're really proud of it, and and I don't, you know, we don't have verification of this, but I would bet that per capita, in terms of our participation rate, I would put us up against any jurisdiction in the in the country that does this kind of work. Seattle, Minneapolis, um, Miami-Dade, Palm Beach County programs that like ours that are very comprehensive. We have, um, if you look at our population, we beat all of them in terms of how much material we're able to keep out of Just the landfills. The, the tonnage yeah, that you yeah, collect. Yeah. yeah, and so, um, but it's, you know, the program's grown. Um, the, the, the reason we got into what we're doing is we realize that it's expensive to dispose of hazardous waste. So to the extent that we can repurpose and reuse some of this, we can't do all of it, but like the reuse area you talked about, if somebody needs a gallon of paint to paint a bedroom or something, or they need um, some cleaning products, if, as long as the label's on there and people can read the instructions, we would be glad for people to reuse the stuff mm -hmm. because it costs us a lot to put it in a drum and ship off. Um, but we've, you know, we're, we're also taking waste cooking oil and we really get after Thanksgiving, for example, and we, we get a lot of people that make the effort of bringing it to us um, and we're able to make biodiesel out of that. And we have a generator that um, we can actually power the whole has waste center if we need to. Um, we're also kind of on the cutting edge on terms of pharmaceuticals, disposing of old medicines and such um, we've got a, a very, um, and, and we're trying to expand that with the pharmacists because we really think the more you can have drop-off points at where people are picking up the, the products in the first place, you know, that's sort of where we want to end up. It's, it's the sheer variety of what you take. Yeah. I mean, if it's nasty and it's in your garage and, you know, we certainly don't want you dumping it in a hole in your backyard, mm -hmm. you can bring it. Uh, to the Household Hazardous Waste Center. So it, it's out Waldo Road, past the airport. You see the signs for the, the transfer station. Right, Levita, Levita Brown, Brown Environmental Park. You yeah. take that ride and it's directly next to the transfer station. And you don't have to get out of your car, like you said. <laughs> it's just kind of drive through. Um, <coughs> it, you know, if only I could get lunch while I was there too, Chris. Yeah, I, I, I don't <laughs> know if that'd be a good place. But. <laughs> That's right. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, something that I counter when I'm out in the public. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people ask me, well, there's, there's the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level, there's the State Environmental Protection Agency, and there's the county, EPD. And some people say, isn't it redundant? Why do you have to have all these different things? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I frequently point out is our relationship with the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about the petroleum management yeah, program yeah. and how we work with yeah. the state? Um, yeah, I can, but just one point is, I mean, I think we look at a lot of government services. Law enforcement is an example. I mean, you have local police, you have state police, and you have federal, and we're no different. I mean, the environment um, is important. But, but speaking of our relationship with the state, we, we have um, a very good working relationship with the state agencies, particularly the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the Water Management Districts. We have a contract with the state where we're actually providing petroleum cleanup and inspection. These are like gas stations with potentially leaking tanks. Um, 
Alachua County has been doing this for 30 years, and we did such a good job in Alachua County, we cleaned up so many sites, the state asked us if we would help with some of our surrounding counties. So we actually, through a contract with the state, and they're paying all of our expenses, um, but it creates local jobs. I mean, we've probably got 15 jobs that are in Alachua County that would otherwise be in Jacksonville or Tallahassee. So it's good locally, but we are providing these services from Flagler County all the way to Levy County. And the, these, these are, the issue with uh, petroleum, people don't understand it, one gallon of petroleum can contaminate over a million gallons of fresh drinking water. So it doesn't take much. You also, I know, um, we were talking about the Household Hazardous Waste Center. Mm -hmm. We contract with the state to provide that service, do we not? We do that for eight surrounding counties. And these tip for in that program, it's typically these rural counties that really just can't afford the staffing or the expertise. And so the state pays us to do that. They pay all our expenses, and they actually help. For each county we do, they give us some extra money to invest in our own program, which cuts our expenses in terms of what we need for our for Alachua County's program. You know, one thing that we like to emphasize, if you're a citizen and you have a concern about something that you see or, uh, you know, you witness something that is damaging to the environment, we're going to put your phone number up on the screen. You can always call EPD to, mm -hmm. to get advice or report, um, and we want citizens to take advantage of that. Uh, I never have enough time with you because you have so much. So I want to I want to get to a few kind of hot topics. Sure. And one that is garnering a great deal of attention is the potential of a phosphate new phosphate mine in Bradford and Union counties, and our concern about its effect on the Santa Fe River. So tell tell us what's going on there. Um, well, again, it's it's the Santa Fe River watershed, and the the, the proposed phosphate mine would be. Um, north of the Santa Fe River, which is our county boundary on the northwest part of the county. Um, but the, the, we have an interest, first of all, our citizens use the river. We have Post Springs Park. We also have a large conservation easement at Hornsby Springs, where Camp Cloacqua is. Um, but we really believe it is in our interest to defend the river. And I think what the county commission has done, they've made a commitment that um, we, we really don't think this is a good place for a mine, and the, the new river is the, where they're proposing to put it. That's a tributary to the Santa Fe River, but it's a very um, undisturbed area that, that it would really be tragic. I think one concern we've got is just how are they going to handle tropical storms and hurricanes, because the history of these mines is they blow out during big rain events. And they, the, the state requirements don't really seem to make them have to deal with that. So we are very concerned. The river, Santa Fe River, has already got enough trouble. And we're trying to work on improving it. Um, and you know, in this case, Union County and the Union County Commission has um, supported our, our efforts. Bradford County, not so much. But we're all neighbors, and we're downstream. And I, I know there's been some question, well, why are we sticking our nose in Bradford County's business? Because we're downstream. Again, the uh, water doesn't seem to respect any lines on no. the map. Uh, Goes downhill. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a new report coming out from the water management districts and the state on minimum flows and levels mm -hmm. and consumptive water use permits. And we're going to have an opportunity to comment on that. So tell, tell us about that. Yeah, well, um, they're, they're for the Santa Fe River in particular, what they said are minimum um, flows. And so that's the minimum amount of water in the river that is determined not to cause significant harm to fish or just the, the function of the river. And um, so we, the, the county commission has expressed an interest in monitoring that. We don't really know yet. We haven't seen, um, at least, um, we haven't seen the final proposed rule yet, but we will be monitoring that. But I, I think there is a concern that, you know, the more consumptive use of water, and that's in the form of these permits that are issued either for agriculture or municipal or private consumption, that the river can only, um, we can only divert so much water from the river. And even, you know, Gainesville Regional Utilities, for every gallon of water they pump out of the ground, for the, their system, 
that's a gallon that doesn't make it to the river to get to, to replenish the springs. So we're looking at ways of being more efficient and again, we, we don't know exactly where we're going to weigh in, but we're monitoring that very closely. Uh, the technical support for the Orange Creek Santa Fe River Basin's mm -hmm. action plans, mm -hmm. what's going on with that? Well, th those plans, there's one for the, what's Orange Creek is really East County, and that's Noonan's Lake, Loch Lusa, and Orange, that whole part. And then the other one is the Santa Fe. These are large watersheds. They basically, almost the entire county is in one or the other of those watersheds. Every five years, they have to be updated. And these are, these are plans to improve the water quality. Both of those systems have been declared by the state and the federal government to be degraded um, you know, where, where they're not really complying with, with acceptable water quality standards. So there's a lot of projects to try to bring them back into compliance. And we do, um, we're very active with that. Our stormwater um, utility that the board adopted a few years ago is going to really help us be able to at least do our part. Uh, this is, this is a, a long question, and I, I need a fairly short answer. I'll uh, try. I know you're involved in the program development for climate change, mm -hmm. resiliency, green infrastructure, low impact design, reducing local water consumption. Give, give us a quick overview of those efforts. Well, Mark, I mean, that's something when we talked, you know, five years ago, we weren't talking as much about it. But, um, you know, climate change is coming, and it's a matter of when. You can argue about whether it's man-made or not, but what we do know is that we're having sea level rise in Florida, and even though we're this far inland, it's going to have an impact on us. Um, part of it is we do anticipate in the future we're going to have people immigrating here or relocating here from the coastal areas as they start losing their water supplies and they start having, you know, extreme weather um, problems, but. But even the, um, the amount of fresh water that we have to use in our community now, in the future, it's probably not going to be as much because with sea level rise, y you start losing some of that. So we really think a lot of what we're doing, whether it's wetland protection, natural resources protection, water filtering, it all has to do with trying to get ready for that. Chris, thank you for your service. Thank you for your stewardship of the environment. And we're going to miss you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. The water we use on our lawns has to come from somewhere. Water for lawn irrigation comes from the same groundwater source that feeds our local springs and rivers. If we want healthy springs to swim in, we all need to use less water. Lawn irrigation is one of our largest uses. Here's how we can reduce it. Inspect your irrigation system annually. Check for leaks regularly. Align sprinkler heads so they don't water your driveway. To learn more about how you can help protect our drinking water and reduce your water bills, visit myyard, ourwater.org.